And now please join me in welcoming Bart Egnall for his talk on the fundamentals of inspirational communication. Thank you so much. That's so great. Well done. Well done. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you for the introduction. And don't beat yourself up over, uh, over what I actually felt was quite inspiring. Um, you know, one of the, the neat things about coming to an event like this is to hear about U of T. And there are moments when you realize, uh, as alum, that you are no longer an undergrad anymore. You know, how many of you have had one of those moments where you said, yeah, I, I'm no longer on campus, I'm no longer going to class, and it hits me. And I had one of those moments back in September. I was, uh, my offices are around Young and Bloor, so I was having lunch with a friend, and we were having lunch at the Holt Renfrew Cafe. And if you've ever been there, it's on the second floor, uh, just looking out over Bloor Street. So we're sitting there, you know, having a nice, quiet conversation, and all of a sudden, this racket breaks out from the street. And, you know, just we kind of ignored it, hoping it would disappear after a few seconds. No such luck. So finally, you know, irritated, my friend goes, go look what's going on. What is that noise? So I, you know, cr you know grouchy, turn around, like, ah, what's going on? I, and I look out and I say, it, it's a parade of children. <laughs> there is a parade of children and no end in sight. And so he comes over and looks and he goes, those aren't children, that's U of T frosh. <laughs> you know, and, and it hit me at that moment that, you know, I was no longer in, in uh, undergrad. And, and it hit me because that would mark 20 years to the week that I had started at U of T. And, you know, there kind of comes a moment where you have to concede that you have left the U of T world behind and become alumni. So an event like this as well is a, is a really great chance though, to embrace what being an alumni is. Uh, I was really uh, honored to have Innes reach out. I had a wonderful time when I, when I spent uh, four years at Innes College and said, hey, you know, why not reconnect with the U of T community? So it's brought back a lot of fond memories about, you know, wasted hours playing NHL 99 in my dorm and, and, uh, and the great history um, courses that I love to attend. So as I thought about, you know, talking to you tonight about leadership communication in your careers, I thought to myself, you know, this is a, was an opportunity for me to reflect on, like, how did I get here? <laughs> how did I get from in this college <laughs> where I live? And actually, if, if you've ever walked by in this college, I lived right here. <laughs> it used to, I think it used to be the campus general store. I don't know what's there now. I haven't, haven't been back. And that was actually my room right there. You know, and at the time it was probably like 50 square feet and I just loved it. You know, I was away from, away from home and loving life. How did I get from there to here? Well, you know, when I finish U of T, I finish with a history degree, you know, let no one ever tell you that a history degree won't get you into the business world. Um, I, of course, decided to defer reality. You know, I applied for my, my master's. I got accepted to do a history master's at American University. And so I was about to embark on that next uh, phase of my life when this woman, Judith Humphrey, who ran a leadership communication firm, came to me and said, look, why don't you put aside that whole history thing? You can always go back to it. History won't change much in a few years. And uh, <laughs> come work for me. And, and you know, coincidentally, she was my mother, so that was the, you know, the secret connection. <laughs> so she, perhaps she had some you know, psychological levers that she could, she could pull. But, um, you know, what she'd done smartly is had me come and do some work with some of her executive clients the previous year. And she said, look, I, you know, she'd built a business. It, it was really her and a few coaches who were actors at the time. And what her business did was it taught CEOs and senior executives how to prepare and deliver speeches that they actually were inspired to give and that audiences were inspired to listen to. So I said, okay, why not? So, you know, abandon that whole history dream. And uh, off I went to the corporate world. And, and, you know, I was digging through the archives. I thought, you know, rolling back the clock. And I found this photo. This was me in, like, 2002, I think. I don't know how I ever got my hair to look like that. <laughs> I think there was, like, one brief moment in time that will never mercifully be repeated. But, you no, know, I, I, I fell in love with the work. I fell in love with the work of helping clients understand how you say something that you actually believe in, that goes beyond just data, goes beyond information, how you actually say something that you're inspired by and that inspires them. And so I spent the first five years of my career there really building my own book of clients and, and getting good at the work and 
writing speeches and, and helping executives deliver speeches. And during that time, a couple, a couple things were happening in the world of business and business communication um, that had a profound effect on, on the work we were doing and kind of led to why, why I'm here today. Two big trends were happening. The first is that when I joined the company, big corporations and governments were really only interested in investing in the most senior executives from a development standpoint. And so it was our, our clientele initially, you know, I, I, were C-suite executives. But within just a few years of joining, I started to notice a major shift, which is that they started saying, it's not about our C-suite. We, yes, they're important, but we want to make investments and we want to develop people at all levels. And they're not just executives. In fact, a lot of the people they, they identified as being critically important for the business didn't even have direct reports. They said, and increasingly they were people earlier in their career. So we started to move away from this pure executive work to developing leaders at all levels. That was the first trend. The second trend that I saw was that communication, and this is a trend that has, has continued to this day, communication was becoming progressively less formal. You know, when I, when I started, it was all about this, the podium, the speech, the scripted speech. I, you know, I, our business, half our business was speech writing. And what was happening rapidly was that the speech was dying. It was being replaced by the presentation, but also by the meeting, by the conversation. It was people saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm walking down the hall, and that's a leadership moment. I've got to be able to have a conversation. I've got to take a call. And what I say in that call will determine whether or not that person is inspired. So as these, these trends started to happen, our business evolved away from just coaching executives towards helping people at all levels speak in these progressively less formal situations. And so I, I, I realized, I saw these trends, and, and I, I saw that what we had in the business was not just unique to my mother, but intellectual capital, a methodology. And so I went to her and I said, let's grow the business. Let's do it. Let's, let's go beyond us and create something where the scale of whom we work with is broadened. And she said, no, I'm okay. <laughs> I like, I, I, because in fairness to her, she, was less, she wasn't interested in the process and everything that would, and having to develop people. She loved the work. And so I, I kind of reached this point where I had to inspire her to believe in the vision. And, and ultimately, I, I pitched the idea. I said, why don't you do what you love here in Toronto, and I'll go, I'll open an office for us elsewhere. So in about 2009, my wife and I moved to Vancouver, and I opened our, our first office outside of Toronto for the business. And this is what we were, this is what we were sold. We went for a week in the summer. It was inspiring. And this is what awaited us upon arrival. <laughs> Any, anyone live here, lived in Vancouver? <laughs> yeah, so you're back here as well. <laughs> you know, if you suffer from seasonal affective disorder, don't go. <laughs> but the, the work was tremendously exciting for me. I, I was thrilled to have my own um, opportunity to find like-minded people who shared my passion for leadership communication. And over the course of several years, I built up the business uh, we grew an office in Vancouver, and we had a Calgary office, we opened a Mexico office, and my mother said, oh, this seems to be going well, um, and then I bought the company from her. And in 2014, you know, I took over as the owner, and I moved back, and you know, today we have almost 50 people around the world teaching leadership communication skills. Um, and, and you know, as much as I love growing the business, what I really love is still the work. I still make a point every year to work with clients. In fact, I met, I met a few people here whose companies I continue to work with because that, you know, the, the work itself is, is exciting. And you know, that's, it's exciting because I get to ask questions. You know, when, a couple of years ago, I decided to ask questions about jargon and language and what kind of language is inspiring. And that led to this book. And, and so over the course of my career, it's been a great chance to ask questions about leadership and about communication. And, and, but the one question I keep asking that I'm going to start by asking tonight is, you know, what makes a leader, right? When you, you're all here, you saw that my topic is speaking as a leader, you know, but can I see a show of hands, how many people manage people right now? We're looking at them, 50%, 50%. So here we are, you know, 
with some people who manage, some people don't, and yet everyone here is excited by leadership, excited by what it means to speak as a leader. And you know, when I, uh, and that excites me, because you know, when I started my career, when you think about you know, what is leadership, what makes a leader, this was kind of the traditional, <laughs> this is Jack Welch, you know, this, he was like you know, the, the star CEO, rock star CEO, on G, you know, he led GE to great results, he was on covers, he went, and you know, this was kind of, the, you know, he runs a big company, he's got a big ego, you know, he goes and speaks at conferences, this is, this is the face of leadership. You know? and it didn't really resonate, I said you know, yes, in some cases this is leadership, but I started to see over the course of my work that this was just one type of leadership and really an overly narrow view for so many reasons. That's so why I kept asking the question, you know, what is leadership? What makes someone a leader? And I hear a lot of things when I ask people, what makes someone a leader? Leaders have integrity. You know, leaders can delegate. They don't try and do it all themselves. They empower their people. They're knowledgeable. No one wants to follow someone without knowledge, right? They're committed. They're committed to what? I don't know, their team, their vision, who knows, they're committed to something. <laughs> uh, but they're passionate too, and they're, they've got vision and expertise. They're, they're credentialed, they know their title, and oh, and you know, they have lots of direct reports. So there you go, all the people who are managing people, you're, you check that box. And, and you know, as I heard all these things over the course of you know, now 17 years, I started to think, these are qualities that are found in leaders, in, but they're not exclusive to leaders. Right? We all know great professionals, great subject matter experts who have integrity, right? who are committed to the work that they do, but where we would say they're not leaders or they have no desire to lead. And so you know, I kept coming back to this question early on in my career, you know, what does it mean to be a leader? And ultimately, you know, I settled on this definition, and it's, it's, I settled on it's you know, our company's view, that what really makes a leader is that a leader inspires others to act. And they don't do it by compelling, and they don't do it because they have a title, they don't do it because people feel they have to listen, but they do it because they can shape the thoughts and beliefs of the people they're speaking to. So that when those people leave the room, they are inspired to take action. So uh, I want to say this one again. A leader inspires action by shaping thinking and beliefs. So implicit in this definition is what a leader is not. A leader did not go to U of T. Sorry, you know, Jonathan. I know we, I know we are the number one call. A lot of them did, a lot of them did right? <laughs> Maybe we should have, I should have had him went to U of T on there. But, um, so you, it doesn't matter what school you went to. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. It doesn't matter what title you have. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert. It doesn't matter if you're an expert or a generalist. The sole criteria for whether or not you're leading is do you inspire people to take action? You know, I'll often work with clients and I'll say, okay, what do you want to do? With, you know, what do you want to talk about in this presentation? Well, I want them to know this, this, this. Okay, yeah, but what do you want to inspire them to do? Well, I want them to know it, but why? Well, you know, they should know it. Yeah, but why? <laughs> People start to get very frustrated with me after a while. And, uh, and eventually they say, well, because finally, you know, finally they kind of erupt. They'll say, well, they know it. They'll understand that we need to invest the money here. And then I'm like, great. That's the action you want to inspire. <laughs> and so that's the criteria. It doesn't matter if you're a great speaker, if you have charisma, does you, can you get your audience to act? So when I, and when I think about this definition and go back to the Jack Welch, you know, the kinds, what you start to see is a much broader range of possibilities for what leadership looks like. And I'll, sh I'll share three examples of people who, to me, are leaders, but three very different kinds of leaders. The first is Hermione Granger. <laughs> Have you ever seen Harry Potter, right? Well, you may know that Emma Watson, you know, this accomplished actress, is also a UN ambassador for the He for She movement, which is a, a movement of men supporting women's advancement. Our, our company is very committed. We've done a lot of work on women's leadership development. So I was really excited when this cause came out. And you know, here she is. She has no direct reports. She has no corporate experience, no bureaucratic experience. And she's standing up at the UN. And she even says, you might, you might wonder what a Harry Potter girl is doing here. <laughs> but you know, she delivered, and she's very small. 
but she has incredible presence and conviction and delivers. If you get a chance, Google her speech. This inspiring talk about why we need to support you know, this movement in women. Elon Musk, right? You know, more of a traditional corporate leader in the sense that he runs a big publicly traded company, but very, but that's kind of where the tradition ends. You know, he, he's really got these deep convictions that run counter to what people have said for years. You can't have a mass-produced electric car. <laughs> you can't have private space flight. You can't build a hyperloop. You know, well, he's already you know, two for three, and it's through strength of conviction, right? That keeps you know. People, I mean, you look at Tesla versus you know, the GM or Ford, they're losing dramatic amounts of money and burning through huge cash, and yet the valuation's higher because of the belief that people have in his vision. He's inspiring people. And Oprah, you know, anyone who saw the Golden Globes speech knows, you know, here's someone who's not only a successful media person, a hugely successful entrepreneur, but someone with the courage to speak out on issues much broader than you know, the Golden Globes would give her the opportunity to do so. so Leadership to me is not, it's not title, it's not the background, it's not where you're put in the org chart. It's can you inspire? Can you inspire action in others? And that's really, you know, at the Humphrey Group, what we teach. That you can't separate that process of inspiration from the process of communication. If you think about this idea that your goal as a leader is to move people, how do you reach them? How do you read? You communicate, right? Whether you speak or you write, that is how you're going to reach your audience. That is how you're going to move them. And that audience might be an audience of one. Right? We were talking about, uh, I was talking to one couple here today, they said, well, you know, they want to be able to inspire their daughter. I said, there may be limits. I have a six-year-old and he, he doesn't really listen to me too much. But really, you know, the inspiration does occur outside the workplace. I know this is a career event, but maybe you coach uh, you know, a youth soccer team. Maybe you volunteer in your community. There, are, the opportunities for leadership, every are, exist every time you speak. Another core belief I have is that everyone, in their own unique style, not by adopting someone else's style, can inspire. Do not. We're not talking about inspiration in the Tony Robbins. I will get you to walk over hot coals. Right, that's, that's kind of what I call motivational speaking. Inspiration to me is something much deeper. You know, motivation, you go, if you go to one of these motivational talks, you kind of leave, you're like, you're all pumped up. And then you leave and it's like, the, the balloon deflates and you do nothing differently. Right? Inspiration is actually a lot less exciting. <laughs> Inspiration is a lot more based on clarity of thinking and the evolution and strengthening of the thinking that you do in the minds of your audience. But for that reason, it's more lasting. So you have to stick to your style. And last, this is a skill. This is not something innate. When you listen to someone, you say, wow, that person's real natural. I can virtually guarantee you that they have worked unnaturally hard to get that good. It doesn't happen by accident. The ability to speak as leader is a skill that you have to learn, you have to apply, you have to practice and self-correct and get better and better and it, through repetition. You do, you know, you gradually build that muscle. I mean, when you look at someone like Steve Jobs, who was a phenomenal speaker and seemed very casual, he would prepare for weeks for his keynotes. You know, so you got to put the work in. So tonight, I'm going to show you, so that you can put the work in, what the skills you need are. I mean, we, you know, I like to say when we work with our clients, our goal is to provide you with the skills so you don't need us anymore. And we teach a methodology that shows how to approach every interaction that you have with the conscious intention to lead. And you're not just going to get to sit here and listen to me. You're gonna, I'm going to put you all to work tonight. You're actually going to identify an opportunity. You're going to create a, a talk, not a formal talk, but you're going to get your thinking clear for someone you want to inspire. And it's a great way to also get to know each other here and do some networking in a more fun way. So three things. The first thing I'm going to show you is how to think about your communication through this lens of leadership. The second thing I'm going to show you is how to script yourself as a leader. And, and don't think of a script as something that you read. Think of a script as getting your thinking clear before you open your mouth. And third, I'm going to talk about when you have that clarity of thinking, how you can deliver it to your audience with presence. 
I mean, we're in a world where we're inundated by distractions, by news feeds, by you know, cell phones. And, and so what's becoming more and more precious is that moment where we actually are present. And if you can create that moment, it's fundamentally going to allow you to share your thinking with your audience. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. It's gonna be pretty interactive so you don't have to listen to me and I can listen to you. And so with that, we're gonna go to our first exercise. And this is a reflection exercise to start thinking about leadership in the way that I'm talking about, in, as inspiring action, not as the hierarchical leadership, not even as the organizational leadership. And so I want you to think of someone, a leader, and I want you to think of them in that context. They, they probably never managed you, who at a critical moment in your life inspired you to act, right? And so it could be you weren't sure about a, taking a new job, and that person inspired you to feel confident that you should. It could be uh, you were thinking of doing a big move. It could be that you were thinking of going to some other university and they inspired you to go to U of T, you know, whatever it is. Um, but they inspired you to act. And so I want you to think about that person. And then I want you to partner up at your table. And I want you to share that story with your partner. Uh, and if you've come tonight with someone you know, I want, I'd encourage you to pick someone you don't know. <laughs> because it's a great way to talk about a, a, a moment in your life that kind of shows who inspired you. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to do that. Uh, so go ahead, share your stories about who's inspired you. Okay. <laughs> Lo love the energy. So what, what we're gonna do, normally, normally I ask for volunteers to share a few stories, but I think it's much more fun since we're meeting people, we're hearing cool stories about leadership, to volunteer or volunteer other people, way more fun. So if you, we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear three stories of leaders who inspired action. And so what I'd like is if you heard a story from someone else that really was inspiring that you think the room should hear, this is your chance to put that person on the spot and volunteer them. So. <laughs> It, put up your hand if you heard something really inspiring that should be shared with the room. Yes, this gentleman right here. So who, who inspired you, sir? Just wait for, if you just wait for the mic, that would yeah, be we'll great. Yeah, we'll wait for the mic. And if you could introduce yourself to, for us. I'm Colin Walsh, Jr. Okay. Um, I had a fantastic five-minute conversation with Naya. You didn't actually tell me a story. <laughs> Because yours was just that, that's 40 advanced, times better. That's an advanced <laughs> tactic, you know? You just Absolutely. get them talking and then you avoid talking. <laughs> um, so she started at U of T uh, mm -hmm. in pre-med, and this is maybe the third day of school or so, uh, walking around campus looking for friends, I guess. Um, <laughs> and this gorgeous young man, apparently, um, made eye contact. She looked over and, you know, he was charming, stuck on right. his hand, said, hey, I'm so-and-so would you like to join our sex ed club? <laughs> <laughs> and of I like and of the course. alternate version here. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, as a young woman says at that time, she obviously said, sure, let's do it. <laughs> um, and it ended up changing her entire um, career path. She ended up studying, I think it was. I'm at a sexual diversity and training school right now. So that moment, that was a pivotal moment. Yep, uh, and worked in the office for four years, I think you said, and uh, continues to work in the field today. What, and what a great story. And I love that the, you started with eye contact, right? That connection. I mean, if he is a, uh, right, it wouldn't have had the same impact. And your life was changed by great eye contact. So thank you. Let's have a hand for story one. Thank you, Colin. Okay, we need a second volunteer. Second volunteer to tell a story that you heard that was inspiring. <coughs> Be brave. Okay, I might just pick somebody if you don't. Yeah, put up just your hand. volunteer someone, Jennifer. Put the mic in someone's hand. I'm. <laughs> I'm gonna volunteer Dominic. Thank you. And so why do stand I stand up for us and tell us? Uh, give us your name and uh, and then the story. I'm Dominic. I'm a family medicine resident at McMaster University. And I was speaking with Raul. So do I, do yes, I can tell, tell Raul's, Raul's story, story for us. Anyway. Okay. Raul is originally from Mumbai, India. And he actually came here two years ago after contemplating what to do after school, after talking it over with his dad. And his dad said, you know, Raul, take risks. Go. Come back if you want. 
Oh, please come back, actually. I want to see you again. <laughs> go, but don't go too long. <laughs> yeah. I, I just found that very touching, yeah. that he, he remembers his dad every day and what he does and who he meets and goes to opportunities like this and pushes his limits. Well it's done. very cool. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> One more. One more. Who was inspired? Yes, right there. We have a, if we get a mic over there, please. It's a good story. Hopefully, I don't screw up. Um, <laughs> my, um, I just met Julia and Leo, and she just uh, told us an inspiring story about both of them. Uh, Julia had a degree in computer, or computer engineer originally, and uh, when she was laid off, um, Leo inspired her to um, pursue a new career that she really interested in in psychology. So now she's on a path of a new career. Not only she graduated, now she's. Um, going into the workforce of uh, psychology. So I thought that was inspiring. Well, yeah, and, and was there someone in that story who really inspired you to leave behind that first degree? Her husband. Oh, yeah. wow, there you go. Well, there's the inspiring leader. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Th thank you for those who, who shared. There'll be other opportunities for everyone, so don't be shy. Uh, no, but these, these are great moments. And you know what I love about these three moments is none of them are traditional corporate leadership moments, right? None of them were, there was an offsite, we all gathered, the PowerPoint was unveiled, <laughs> and then leadership happened, right? No, it's like I was walking across campus and I looked across and our eyes met across a, you know, a crowded room, right? and then sex ed happened, you know? So <laughs> dad looked at me and he said, go, but don't go for more than 14.3 months, you know? But these are the moments that change our lives, right? And they are leadership because they inspire us to act. And they inspire us to act because they change how we think. So how do you do that? These, the stories are great because they show the impact that leaders have had on, on us. Now how about when you're ready in your career or in your life to have that same impact on others? So let's look at how you do that. Step one, you have to begin with the right intention, and that's, that's what we call adopting the leader's mindset. It, it, it won't surprise you that I say that most communication in the corporate world and the, in the world of government is stultifyingly uninspiring, right? It's death by PowerPoint, death by email. It's like you sit through a meeting and say, oh my gosh, just trying to inhale this information is exhausting. And, and so people who want to lead, who want to inspire, recognize that. And they, they actually approach their preparation or preparation in the moment very differently. And so in your folders, if you, if you look at the folders or the printouts that you have, the dark ones, I'm going to be going through elements of our methodology. And I'm going to touch on some, highlight, some, some of the highlights. But I would encourage you, following the workshop, to go and review it in more depth. Because uh, obviously in 90 minutes, we can't do a deep dive. But I'm gonna, when we talk about the leader's mindset, I'm going to highlight three areas that I think are worth focusing on for you. And the first is that you've got to think about moving from what I would call information to inspiration. <coughs> Most communication, I said, in the world of work is information focused. And, and it's not surprising, people will say, oh, can you present the results? Can you talk to me about the program? Can you give me an update on the quarterly numbers, right? So people ask for information. Can you email me and tell me how that, that thing is going? Can you, here's the job description. Right, so we, we ask for information. And consequently, a lot of the communication that we do is about transferring information, right? You think about, we synthesize, and then we say, oh, you know, I start with one, and then two, and three, and here's my conclusion, so I'm, I'm gonna take the audience through that. And at best, you get well-organized, well-packaged information. But what that does is it forces the audience to do the synthesis, it forces them to think about what the point is. And, and I'll tell you, at the executive level, I, they hijack it. They're like, no, uh, let me interrupt. Let me hear, because they don't want to wait. <laughs> and so what audiences really crave is not content, but clarity of thinking. So you want to think about not what do I want to talk about, but what do I want to inspire them to do? We'll come back to that in a moment. Another characteristic or way of thinking about the leader's mindset is to, have, is to think about vision. You know, vision isn't just like a big V corporate vision like Nike, where it's, oh, to be the number one athletic company in the world. 
if you work in a big company, you, need, you can have vision as well. I was talking with uh, a woman who works at IBM. Um, where, where is she? Can see. Show of hands if you, ah, yes, and sorry, and see, remind me of your name. Raji. Raji, and Rajali, uh, did I get that right? Raji or, or Rajani? Rajani is a manager at IBM, and she said, I said, who do you have to inspire? And she said, I have to inspire worker or my staff who join my team who are kind of like focused on like deliver this t software tomorrow because it's uh, data storage software, data warehouse. data warehouse software. I have to inspire them to also think about their career, the vision that they are going to have for their career. So when you think about vision, it's not just the IBM corporate vision. It's her as a manager inspiring her people to understand what their careers could be. To give you a, a, a more corporate or a more public example of how powerful vision can be, my wife is a marathon runner. I'm a cyclist, but I'm you know she's a marathon runner, so I have to listen to a lot about running. And as, you know, I want to inspire her to love me and support my cycling, which is far more time consuming. But anyway, so as many of you may or may not know, the two-hour marathon has never been broken. Uh, they've come close within minutes, but last year Nike set out to break the two-hour marathon. And it was very public. They said, we're going to break it. And, and this was the vision. Uh, their vision was, we will you know, push the limits of human performance and have someone run a sub-two-hour marathon. And it was really cool. You know, they went out, and they, they had a specific pacing group who was, you know, each person was the fastest in their, their time. They had, they built a custom shoe. They had a controlled track. They had, I mean, they really, it, every detail they could control, they could control. And last May, they ran it. And they didn't make it. But they did set a new world record for a marathon. And so to me, this vision just shows how you can engage and excite. I mean, there were tons of people who had nothing to do with the project who were inspired to run because of that. So when you think about your work or your life, vision is, a, is about painting for people a, thought, a picture of what the future could be. It's about saying, Hey, if you go, if you leave India and you go to Canada, think of the possibilities, right? Think of when you come back, how happy we'll be. So the clock's ticking. <laughs> so that's, that's another way that you can have the leader's mindset. The last point I want to make about the leader's mindset is that it takes some guts. Because if we hold that leadership is inspiring action by changing thinking or beliefs, well, when you speak, you've got to change those beliefs. If your audience leaves thinking and feeling the same way they did before you spoke, nothing will happen. You know, I, I, example of someone courageous, you know, when Justin Trudeau became prime minister, you know, he came out and he said, we're going to have 50% gender balanced uh, cabinet. And someone said, why? He said, because it's 2015. And, you know, Trudeau had the courage to challenge the idea that, oh, we'll just get there over time, and you know, he, he took a position. So you, you've got to have the willingness to be, uh, to have people push back you and challenge your views. I would say you should have more than the willingness, you should welcome it. If no one in your meetings, if no one in your conversations, if no one in your management, uh, the people you're managing, if no one in the areas where you want to lead is pushing back, it's actually that they're disengaged, right? That you're not challenging their thinking. Leaders are always pushing people forward to think and believe differently. So if your uh, messages are not doing that, they're probably just platitudes. So that's the leader's mindset. It's really about moving from, this is what I want to talk about, to how do I want to inspire people? How do, what kind of action do I want to inspire? Through my strength of conviction. And so that brings us to our next exercise. So I want you to pull out you can, a piece of paper, you can write in the back of that, that Lear script page. And I just want you to write down two things. I want you to think of an audience whom you want to inspire. It could be an audience of one. It could be an audience of 1,000. But I want you to pick someone real. I, you know, let's take this out of the realm of the theoretical. And say who in the, and I'd like you to pick someone in the next month. Someone or some group who you want to inspire. And what do you want to inspire them to do? And, and remember, it's not Tony Robbins' walk across hot coals inspiration. It could be you want to inspire them to fund a project. It could be you want to inspire them to join your team. It could be you want to inspire your coaching kids' soccer. You want to inspire them to come together 
as a team rather than focusing on you know, scoring goals, whatever. But be really specific. Who's the audience? What do you want to inspire them to do? Take a moment, write that down. All right, if we can grab our mics. And if, we're going to see if we have any volunteers before I have to start pointing at people. So let's, let's hear a couple examples. Show of hands, uh, put up your hand if you'd like to share your audience and what you want to inspire them to do. Bueller, Bueller, there we go. Okay. Let's say, you know, if you've, if you've never watched Ferris I used to make the, if you haven't seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you got to watch it. The problem is, as I age now, you know, 20 years from university, fewer and fewer people <laughs> laugh at that joke, so I'm dating myself. Yeah, if you could stand up for us, please. And share, you know, tell us who you are, and then who's your audience, what do you want to inspire them to do? Mike. Hello. Hi, everybody. My name's Bilal. Uh, so my audience is my family and anybody else around them, pretty much. But it's my main focus is my direct family. And I want them to start focusing more on, like, sort of regulating their physical health. Mm -hmm and trying to exercise. I mean, I'm a uh, Pakistani background, or my parents are Pakistani, and they come from a very conservative and old-fashioned mindset where women aren't meant to be strong. They're meant to stay at home, do whatever needs to be done at home. I mean, I guess there's certain types of strengths they're meant to have, but, like, my mom's fine with me giving her a back rub or uh, <laughs> massaging her legs for the rest of her life. I mean, I'm fine with doing that, too, but I want her to take care of her health as well, right? Start walking, get to the gym, hey, take ownership of I'll your health. I'll drop her off. It's not even a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. But that's something, you know, it's I never too late to start. I love it. Yeah. Uh, and, and my mom, on a personal note, my mom who's retired mm -hmm. now, actually, you know, she never exercised at all. Now she's at Equinox, the gym, mm -hmm. three times a week. And she comes to our house and she's like, let's plank. Exactly. Like, mom, I'm tired. So there's hope. Yeah, okay, there's thank you for sharing. That's great. Okay, we have. okay, another one. Another one. Yes, right over there. Uh, right there. Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda. Uh, the audience I want to inspire is my boyfriend. I <laughs> is he here tonight? No, he's not. Okay. That's why I'm here to share. <laughs> And I want everyone to brainstorm with me. The <laughs> action I want to inspire him to take is to go abroad to work with me. Very exciting. Okay. And, and, so where, never and where will away. it be? Uh, maybe Asia. Very exciting. All so right. he's never stopped away from Canada. It's I think time. it will be a pretty yeah, uh, inspiring uh, moment. Excellent. And Thank you for sharing that. For him. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. One more. One more. We've got one right there. Yeah. This Hello. Hi, my name is Albert Quinn. I uh, run a social innovation program for students at the University of Toronto, specifically in the Faculty of Engineering. And what I'd like to inspire them to do is to um, iterate on their ideas, test out new ideas, mm -hmm. in light of the fact that social innovation is a very long, hard process. Um, so to have the kind of empowerment for them to keep trying and right. to keep pushing forward, even though they know that the change will be small and that the term of their change will be long. Love it, thank you. It is. Yeah, and, and, and a great example because you really need, you know, that long-term commitment and belief in, in social enterprise and social change to stay the course. All right. Good. So three great examples. You're going to be sharing more in a moment, but this is the starting point. This is the starting point. We're not thinking about what you're going to say. We're not thinking about what facts you're going to marshal. No PowerPoint slides have been assembled. You're thinking about who's my audience and what do I want to inspire them to do. That is the starting point. And that's when I say, you know, begin with the right mindset. So you've done that. You've got the mindset. You're ready for step two. And that's to craft your script. And I, and I really I do want to stress, when I say script, I don't mean something that you stand up and you read. A script, like when I do Q&A prep, with a script is up here. All right. a script is really about clarity of thinking. So you have on your table a copy of our leader script. You can also, I'll tell you at the end, download this and get a PDF version. But we've been using this for you know, almost 30 years now. Uh, and it's, it's a tool designed to help you get clarity of thinking. 
So I'm not gonna go through all the elements on the script. I'm gonna focus on th what I believe are the three most important ones. Subject, message, and call to action. So, you're gonna, so what is a subject? A subject is in one sentence what you wanna talk about. Mom, dad, I wanna talk to you about getting fit. <laughs> Uh, unnamed boyfriend, I want to talk to you about why you better follow me or else. <laughs> yeah. So it, it defines, it tells your audience, this is what we're going to talk about. But it's not inspiring. Right? It's, just, it's just informational. It's, a, it's like drawing a, a, a border around the information that you have. Now, you want a, you want a subject that's appropriately focused. Right? So too, too narrow would be, I want to talk to you about working out tomorrow. Right? That's too broad would be, I want to talk to you about health. Right? You want an appropriately focused subject. So that's subject. The next sentence, though, is about leadership, and it's crucially important. It's the message. The message is the single idea that you believe that you want your audience to believe in, too. So it's not a statement of fact. It's an idea. It's an idea that reflects your conviction. And we go back to that courage piece. Like, it should invoke some, something like a, oh yeah, prove it, How, why you say that, why should I believe that? That's when you know you're getting somewhere. And the last component of the script is the call to action. Okay, the whole purpose of speaking as a leader is to inspire action. You'll see at the bottom of your script there's call to action. This is the litmus test. Do you, so you, you, you speak, you have a conversation, you give a present, whatever, and then you say, okay, here's what I want you to do, or here's what I'm going to do. So an effective call to action is two things. It's concrete. So that means it's not something generic like, well, I look for your support. It's, I want you to fund my social enterprise to the tune of you know, 400,000 over three years. Right? It's gotta be concrete. Because if it's not concrete, the audience can wiggle around and, and say they're committing, but not. The second thing it has to be is it has to be time stamped. When do you want it done by? <laughs> if you don't put a time stamp on it, can just go off into the ether. So let's look at two examples of this. The first example, <coughs> subject. So, so you can imagine someone inside a company who's you know, a, tasked with looking at the finances and then making recommendations. So subject, I'd like to discuss how we should invest our profits next year. Message, I believe our best rate of return will come from acquiring our major competitor. You can imagine the executive saying, well prove it, why, why that? Why don't we reinvest in our own business? Why don't we pay out a dividend, why don't, you know, whatever. But that creates the engagement. Call to action. You know, so let's assume that that individual is convincing. At the end, they say, okay, so the audience says, all right, well, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. Where do we go from here? Well, next week, I'd like to engage our investment bank to discuss this acquisition. And then you know, because they're like, oh, no, that's moving too fast. No, oh, I don't think we should do that. Let's, keep, let's wait a year. Right? So when you have a, a concrete, time-sensitive call to action. Let's look at another example. I want to discuss the vice president of sales position. I'm confident I'm the right person to take on this role and can deliver the results the company's after. You know, you want to put yourself forward. You see an opportunity for a job, you got to inspire that person. And then I will, in the call to action, after you show why you were the right person, I'll be putting my name for it. I'd like your support. So three sentences. And getting to the essence of these then allows you to like an accordion, fold it out for you know 30 minute presentation or compress it for a 30 second conversation. Right? The problem with the informational model is you've got, okay, I've got to take you through the background, here's the situation, here's some research I did, here's some facts, and here's my conclusion, right? And you've got to, it forces you to go through all this and then you show up and they're like, oh, sorry, you only have three minutes. Mm, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm just gonna speak really fast. <laughs> Instead, you say, that's fine. You don't need any of the information. What I wanted to talk to you about was blank. Here's my message, and here's where I think we should go. So let's try it. So I want you to take, we're going to tackle the opportunity you just identified, the audience, the opportunity, and you're going to write your subject, your message, your call to action on your, on your one page. And then once you've got it, you're going to pick a new partner and you're gonna share that with them. You're gonna share, you're gonna explain the scenario, who's the audience, what you wanna inspire them to do, and then you're gonna give them your script. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes on this. I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes to work on it, so spend maybe five minutes working on it, and then 
five minutes to share. And then, of course, we're going to have some more volunteers. <laughs> okay, go for it. All right, let's, let's get a couple examples. I, I have the nice thing about doing this. I get to walk around and be inspired by your, your scripts. And so I like having that uh, sharing go on in the room. So let's get three volunteers to share their scripts. And if you could introduce yourself, tell us who your audience is, and then give us your subject message call to action. Okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lala Muatadid. I'm a mathematician, and I do research in theoretical <laughs> computer science. So I also teach a lot of math and uh, CS classes. And uh, if you've ever been in the STEM field, you notice that as you get to upper level courses and you get to master's level, the number of female students just seems to reduce. So. <laughs> Okay, so my, my, uh, my audience is all my female students. I work with, uh, I went to a lot of uh, undergraduate projects. So my subject is I want to talk about research. My message is very simple. I just want to encourage them to ask dumb questions because research is just a series of dumb questions until you get something. And <laughs> my action is uh, give them a, a paper and ask them to read it and come back with a criticism. So it is a published, I like that. Paper, find a theorem you don't like in the paper, find a proof, find a proof you think you do differently, mm -hmm. just find something that you can criticize. And once you do that, I know it's, it might sound counterintuitive, but it gives you the confidence that mm -hmm. I can do math and I can do it as good or maybe better than whoever published this right. paper, so therefore I can publish a paper myself. Okay. Stay, stay there for one sec. We're going to just <laughs> delve into it. She can keep the mic. Okay. Keep it. I have to say, I, my ex one experience with computer science when I was at U of T, I was uh, the registrar in this, who's still there, this great guy, Donald Bohr. It's like, if you need an easy science course, go take the how and why of computing. So I went in and they're like, this is a mouse. This is a keyboard. And I was like, this, this is good. Until a month and a half in, they're like, today we're going to learn to write Turing. And you have to program a calculator in two days. I was like, ah, oh, this is bait and switch. But anyway, so th th thank you for your, your script. And, and what I want to, we go back to that vision piece, right? What I'm hearing implicitly from your, your intro is that, your vision is more women in computer science. Is that, is that right? And that's why you've chosen this audience? Yeah. So I think in your, bring that into your message. Because right now your message is implicitly saying that to these women. But what do you want them to believe about their potential in computer science or more women in computer What is it that you want those women who you're speaking to to believe? Uh, they're just as good, if not better. I might get in trouble for if not yeah. better <laughs> than, yeah. than their male uh, colleagues. Or yeah, and, and I think that's, I would go with that because, you know, you think back to the first question we asked, of moments where someone inspired you, right? Imagine those women 10, 15 years later in an event like this saying, I, I was thinking about dropping out or I wasn't sure if it was me because so few women were in the program and I heard this idea and it stuck with me. So. Stay to that belief. It's so, more, so powerful, and clearly it comes from a very authentic place. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've got a couple over there. Okay. I believe I saw someone. In, in, the, the, in the pink shirt back there. Oh, one of the pink shirts. With a pink shirt, please stand up. From pink to pink, right? <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is... Again, I apologize, I, I, I have a little bit of a stammer. Um, so my audience is um, a university club at the University of Toronto. It's called Rational Capital Investment Fund. Um, so my background is I'm, a, I'm an analyst at an asset management firm. And uh, I want to go to this club. I used to be a member. And I want to uh, inspire these students and uh, give them the courage to uh, uh, develop certain models and habits such that they can break into the industry. Uh, and so to go from subject to message to uh, call to action, um, I'm here to talk to you about the power of positive feedback loops. I believe that if you act and leverage the power of this model, you can achieve outstanding results in whatever path you take in life. Mm -hmm. I want you to kickstart and accelerate your development as a human being by developing yourself uh, to continuously learn through persistent and intense reading, writing, thinking, and communicating 
until the end of the year. Thank you. Don't, don't give up the mic just yet. So I love, I love your subject and your message. I was, I was very inspired. Then what I'm waiting for is, OK, let's get even more concrete in that call to action. So here I am. I'm a member of this club. I'm inspired. You're, you're a success. You're sharing with me. And I love that it's more than just in asset management, this philosophy of success. What, what do you want me to do, one tangible thing I can do to start down this path in the next month? Well, I've got three in mind already, actually. Uh, <laughs> and to kind of uh, condense it very uh, quickly, the first would be to read uh, some books from some of the best investors in the world, okay. like Munger and well, were, uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. Uh, the second would be to do uh, case studies of uh, investment ideas that worked out in the past. And the third would be to uh, apply what you learn in books and in the case studies to the real world and conduct your own research of businesses that you think are going to be great investments. Love it. That is so tangible. Thank you so much. <laughs> one more. One more. We have one at the other end of the room. I think the uh, job title of the first speaker, mathematician, is possibly the coolest job title <laughs> in the world. I've always been horrible at math, and I'd love to call myself that. <laughs> um, my name is Matt Capobianco. I'm the deputy director of an um, international disaster relief agency called Global Medic here in Toronto. And um, my, uh, the person or individual I was looking to speak to, I've got a uh, meeting coming up next week with a member of the annual foundation, and that is essentially the Rogers family. So. Um, my uh, subject message and call to action were based on uh, this meeting and essentially that, that pitch to them. Great. So um, the uh, subject was that I'd like to talk to them about long-term strategic support from the annual foundation for our agency. Okay. Um, the message was that um, we as Global Medic are the uh, best positioned agency to uh, implement their international disaster relief funding allocations in the most efficient and effective manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, my call to action, which to be honest, until we had done this exercise, I hadn't really thought mm -hmm. of it in this way for anything like this. Um, so thank you for that. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, the call to action is, I want to formalize a strategic partnership mm -hmm. whereby the annual foundation funds uh, our agency for 250K a year over a three year strategic term. Love how concrete that is. And it is, isn't it great to actually think about, okay, what is it I want? What will success look like? Because that then back, you know, working backwards shapes what you say. So for your job, by the way, sounds really cool as well, like disaster relief. I feel like, uh, you know, I, that, you know, would be very exciting. But, and I love your, your clarity on this call to action and your subject. I want to get to that message for a moment. Because how long have you been in the, in the, the business of disaster recovery? About 10 years. 10 years. And how long with your, the current organization? Uh, it's been about the majority of the time with that agency. So yeah. if you were sitting over a couple drinks with someone and they said, look, shoot straight with me. There's three or four disaster recovery agencies I, should fund, I could fund. In one sentence, why you? What would you say? Uh, because we are the most accountable, efficient, transparent, and effective agency in the world at providing emergency relief in disaster situations. See, now that's getting to conviction, right? That's, the first one was more corporate. Now we're getting to what you believe, right? And when you're in that meeting and you want to be able to speak with passion, get to the essence of that. So nicely done. Thank you. Thank you, Conley. So three, three really different examples, right? Three really different examples of audiences, opportunities. But as you can see, you know, getting to that clarity around these three components of the script it's actually quite challenging, right? I think it was Mark Twain who said, excuse the length of this letter, I didn't have time to be brief. It's hard work to get to, to simplicity of thinking. It, and so you, but imagine if it's taking, if it takes us this much time on a topic that we're passionate and knowledgeable about to get to clarity, what are the odds that if you don't do that for your audience that they will reach that clarity themselves? Very low. So that's why you do the work in advance to get to clarity. So that's the second step, right, to script yourself. Then comes time to deliver it. 
and I don't mean deliver like this. Stand, I mean, I, I don't give many of these formal talks. Most of the communication that I do, most of the communication that my clients do is informal. It's on the phone, it's in the meeting, it's in the conversation. But in those situations, you still need to project presence. I mean, what is, what is presence? This is a word that's thrown around a lot. It, it literally means that you and your audience are present. You are connected. I mean, think about in life. And I alluded earlier to all the, you know, the distraction world that we live in. How often are you really present? How often is you, are you present with an audience? There's that moment where you walk across campus and you meet someone and they look you in the eye and they establish connection and you and they are present in the moment that changes your life. As humans, we, why did we come out here tonight? Why are you here rather than watching a, a recorded video? Why, when I travel in business, the airports are full, the restaurants, because we crave connection, right? We crave those moments. We, we want to look people in the eye. We want to hear what they say and have that moment where we are present fully. The good news is you can create those moments. You can consciously and purposely connect and create presence with your audience. So when we talk about executive presence, we're talking about leadership presence, we're not talking about flash. We're not talking about use big gestures in the big room and you know use a large vo a loud voice and step away from the podium and move around. No, that's not what presence is. Presence is personal, it's deeply personal, it's different for every person. You know, some people are very small physically who have incredible presence, people with quiet voices and loud voices. Presence is about connection. The good news is you can consciously project presence. And there are four ways that you can do it. And I want to tell you them. The first way is with your body language. Now, we use body language to connect, right? We, so that we are present. So what is, how do you do that? Well, first, you want to be physically open, right? You want to remove barriers. If you're standing up there, I mean, if I was standing behind the podium with my arms crossed, right? Or, you know, I'm sitting here to talk to you, right? I, I'm signaling to you that we're disconnected, right? So you want to, whether you're sitting, whether you're standing, you want to get those barriers out of the way. You want to use gestures that create space, that convey your ideas, rather than you know, busy gestures that dissipate your presence. Right? You know, you got these small gestures, right? These are distracting gestures. I've got, you know, I'm moving, right? I'm, you know, so yeah, I've got my, I'm moving around on the stage. These are competing with my ability to connect with you. So I want to remove any physical distractions or physical barriers that are going to get in the way of us connecting. And then I want to think about using my, my body language to convey my ideas, right? All of us, right? A gesture that conveys that we're moving from here to here. So body language is the first way that you can convey your ideas and be present with your audience. The second way is with eye contact. Right? It's, it's not just for campuses. <laughs> if you have to get the attention of your boyfriend who has never left Canada, <laughs> He'd better be looking you in the eye, <laughs> right? You know, if it's probably if you know he's on his phone, right? It's probably not a good time to broach the subject. He's not ready to be inspired, or maybe you have to look at him. <laughs> so, if you want to reach someone, if you want to reach a group, it starts with eye contact. I this is I so often see this in meetings and board. Someone comes up to speak and said, "Good morning, good morning, podium. What a beautiful podium I see here. Yeah, and, and uh, nice to be, nice to be here. It's like." you are signaling to your audience where, that you are not connected. You are signaling that you are focused on your, your notes. Begin with connection. In a meeting, if you're starting a meeting, uh, I'll often see people just start talking if they're running the meeting. Begin with connection, with eye contact. Once you have, because let's think about what we're talking about. In, we're inspiring action by investing time in shaping ideas, shaping beliefs. We're using communication to get our ideas to that audience. If you are not connected with that audience, they are not ready to receive your ideas. So eye contact is the second way. And it's not that you're, 
you're going to zone in on someone you know, with the laser eye contact, right? This is very uncomfortable. It's conversational, right? It's conversational eye contact. The most important moment in the in conversation is the end of the sentence. It's when you finish the thought. I mean, you can kind of be thinking, eh, I'm talking this, some slides, but when you make the point, you finish looking someone in the eye, and then and then the thought is delivered. So that's the second way you can project presence. The third way is through pace. A lot of the times when people think about pace, they think about what I would call rate of word delivery. Right? So they say, oh, I'm going to say, I talk too fast. And so I'm going to slow down and speak in this robotic monotone that will bore you and lull you to sleep. <laughs> right? Pace, sure, it can be rate of word delivery. And you can, you can use a really rapid rate of word delivery to signal to your audience that something's not important. Or you can use a very slow rate of word delivery to place emphasis without changing your volume. But more often, the best way to use pace to project leadership is with rate of idea delivery. And this is through the power of the pause. Think about what we're talking about, right? We're taking a thought, we're developing the thought, and we're handing it to someone, right? That's why we connect with our eye contact, that's why we use our body language. We hand them the thought. We have to then give them a moment to digest that thought. So if you move on, here's one thought, and then there's the next thought, and then there's another thought, and there's the next thought. Eventually, the audience just says, I'm not listening. Right? So the pause is how you let the thought sink in, in a, in a room where the audience isn't going to speak. But it's also in a conversation how the, you give the audience the opportunity to say, actually, I don't know about that. So it's crucially important, the power of the pause. The fourth and final way is through expression. You know, I have two young kids, a six-year-old and a two-year-old, and they are just addicted to books. You know, we read all the time. And you really, to keep a kid's attention, you've got to crank up the expression. <laughs> you know, you can't say, Thomas went up the bridge again, though I would like to after the number of times I have to read the <laughs> stupid book. You have to be like, the, Thomas went up the bridge. Chug, 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 chug. Right, and then they're like, ah, that's exciting, you know? <laughs> I'm like, yes, it was exciting for me the first 50 times we read it. <laughs> 51, not so much. But if you've all, it's also like you go to a movie, right? There's a soundtrack. If you ever watched a movie without the sound, it's actually like a lot of work to try and figure out what's happening. Like, think of horror movies, how much music and sound creates anticipation, right? In fact, they mess with you, right? Because they, they, you hear music, you think, oh my God, someone's going to die, and then no one does. You're like, oh, it's a relief until they die in the next scene. So think of expression when you speak as sound a soundtrack, right? You ha you're telling your audience an idea. Help them hear how they should think and feel about it. Should they be excited by it? Should they be afraid of it? That's about raising and increasing your range of expression. So when we work with our clients, we, we talk about these as tools that you can consciously use. And at first, and some of you have actually been through our training, I know I taught one one woman said, oh, I hope you're not bringing the video camera out again, because we, we too torture our clients. We videotape them. We don't actually do it to torture them. We do it so that they can, they feel uncomfortable when they're having to be very conscious about projecting leadership, and we want them to sit in this, the audience and see on video that they actually are much more connected. And actually, even though they felt really awkward at first, felt, appeared more authentic. More con and so gradually you resolve by doing this, you resolve that cognitive dissonance. <laughs> And you're like, oh, yeah, actually, I do feel more comfortable because my audience is connected. But I, I illustrate, I use that to illustrate the fact that initially you may have to do some things, whether it's thinking about communication, getting a message, or projecting leadership that feels uncomfortable but will actually be more powerful for your audience. And it really is all about your audience. So those are the four tools. How much time do we have left? Excellent. We have time for some final volunteers. And I've got two, these are our final volunteers. I want two volunteers. And this time, I have prizes. I have prizes. So I, I brought copies of my book. It's true. The stakes are up. The stakes are up. There weren't prizes before. Because this is the final test. I need, we're going to get two people to come up here on stage. Oh, we, you're already volunteering. <laughs> All right. I didn't even have to say, come up here and dance. No. Well, you shouldn't wait for me to finish. 
you know, Victoria, come on up. No, seriously, Victoria's going to come up. She's going to leave her script behind. And she's going to uh, but speak with presence about whatever it is that you were going to inspire. So we'll give you the mic as you come up. And our first volunteer will be Victoria. Let's have a hand for her. OK. I actually prefer to dance here, actually. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Victoria Guo. I'm currently a manager in Treasury at Scotiabank. And uh, so a little bit background of my topic today is my audience is my boss and my colleagues. And the point here I'm trying to convey to them is it's really important to um, allocate certain budgets to actually get these uh, soft skill training courses for everybody in your team. Because most of our teammates are really good at analytics, they're good at numbers, but when it comes to present stuff, then people are like, um, <laughs> these numbers means it's higher or lower than last year. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that's a bit background of the topic I'm gonna talk today. And now so, take it away, go ahead. Okay, so imagine everybody here is my boss and my colleague. Um, <laughs> So today, I would like to bring to your, uh, your attention that we need to cer uh, allocate certain budget to train our coworkers on their presentation skills and communication skills. From what I've seen in the past, I strongly believe that certain skill set is crucial in our work. It's crucial when it comes to build a strategic relationship with our business partners, and it's crucial to convey message to our senior management more efficiently and more effectively. So the suggestion I have is by the end of this year, we spend 5% of our annual budget in training our coworkers on how to improve their communication and um, presentation skills. And I hope together with our, um, I guess, corporate teamwork, by the end of this year, we see our team, everybody are stronger and communication and delivering a stronger results. Wow. Yeah. Don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere. No. This, book, this book, unfortunately, is not free. There's a little bit more work to do. So, Dance? Yeah, absolutely. The dancing. No, that, that was tremendous. I mean, you know, when I think about the clarity of your thinking around your, your message and your call to action, and it's kind of a double message because of the topic tonight. So you really embody that. So well done. And, and a couple things I want to note that you did really well. You know, your body language. You have great presence. You, you know, you reach the room. You use strong gestures. And you projected vocally. Your power of the pause during your talk really allowed us to digest each idea. So tremendous on that. Thank you. Yeah, the one thing I want, I'm gonna, the one piece of guidance I'm gonna give you is around eye contact. So what you have going now is a bit of what I'd call a sprinkler. Right, you're giving a little, a little bit of eye contact to everyone. The key is to give more eye contact to fewer people. So I want you to do, just do your message, that's it. Mm -hmm. And I want you to pick someone and start looking at that person and then I want you to pick only one other person in the room, and I want you to finish with that person. Let's give that a go. Just one sentence. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess I'm going to talk about something different. I don't. That's fine. Repeat. We don't don't worry about the content. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I picked that pink uh, lady in the pink shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know how, uh, what brought you here, and I'm really happy that uh, everybody make the time and the effort of coming here in the cold night. And um, I hope you really enjoyed um, the speech today and the exercise we do together, we did together with everybody in the room. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, from today, we all get to improve our leadership skills and um, effectively, you know, lead our team or, uh, the people you want to influence. Very good. So, how, how did it feel? How, how did it feel having to making that connection? And who was it? Who was it you connected with? In the, did you feel the connection? Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and, and how did it feel for you making that, that link? Um, I guess the feedback I get from her is really good because she smiled and I get... Yeah. She seems some... friendly. She's not going to attack exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess I get some support, yeah. uh, positive support from Absolutely. her. And um, it looks like um, coming back to her is also like kind of... Uh, I, I kind of reminded myself a little bit, mm -hmm. but I think when I get more used to it, it it's more natural. Yeah. And then it becomes a conversation that you made that connection. And every other person in the room will feel that they might be the one you look at next. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. You earned this. <laughs> I'll take that. Thank you very much. Well done. One more. One more volunteer. Yes. Come on up. Much easier to get people when I give out books. I should have, should have started earlier. <laughs> there we go. So if you could introduce yourself, tell us about your opportunity, and then off you go. OK, thank you. So. It's different when you're up here. Um, <laughs> so thank you to my partner for helping me refine my message. My name is Neroja. I work in the public sector. I am a manager, um, and my team works on project management. We work on a private-public partnership. Often it feels like our private partners are our enemy, and I'm sure they think the same thing about us. Um, <laughs> so today we, uh, we kind of had like a celebration at our office, and it was one of my colleagues on my team who came up with the idea. And she wanted to throw a party to thank our private partners, and it was her idea, and I thought it was wonderful, it was, it was great. So I, my context is that I want to use that uh, to deliver uh, my message. <coughs> Candice, I want to thank you. I, I want to also acknowledge you for taking the initiative and taking leadership to create the change that you want to see. I'm inspired how you take a stand in wanting to show other people that you value them. And <clears throat> Candace, I think this is a great example and I want everyone to know that this is an example of how we change the culture to what we want it to be. And <clears throat> I encourage everyone in the next week to have a conversation with someone else in the office or two or three other people to talk about an idea that you have to change the culture and make our work environment better and talk about a few actions that we can take as a group to see that through. And I, love, I would love to hear more about those conversations in the coming week. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to give you some water. There you go. So, well done. You know, I think that if I think about the four elements of presence, the two that really stood out for me, for you, were your physical presence, your body language. You just own that stage. You're there, you're present, you're facing the audience, and your expression. I mean, what came out is the, the gratitude and how you were inspired by Candace. So, really keep going on those. The one um, piece of guidance I'm going to give you is around the power of the pause. So you notice that when you're finishing your thoughts, you're, you're linking them with the word and. End the thought, let the silence sit, and then move to the next. And we'll be with you because you are so compelling as a speaker. So I'm going to make you do it again. Okay. Just, but just two really sentences. Yeah, that's why I give you the water. You thought that was free. Um, so all, all, you don't need to give us a context. Give us your subject and your message. And if it's not exactly the same, no one's going to mind. OK, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining the Friday team meeting. I want to start by talking about the celebration we had last week that Candice, that you led. Candice, I want to acknowledge you and appreciate how much you take leadership and initiative to show everybody else that you value them. And you had this amazing idea to throw together a, a, a party, a celebration for our private partners uh, at, the pri at the company, and you got buy-in, and we were all so excited about it, and they appreciate it. So I want to thank you, and I want you to know that I'm inspired by you. Well, and I'm sure that everybody else, <laughs> we were all inspired by what Candace did, and, and, and that's us. That's what each of us 
are capable of. And in the next 30 days, I want each of us to have a conversation with somebody else on the team or two or three other people and share an idea that you have that will improve our culture and improve our work environment. And please, please feel free to share your ideas with me as well. Wow. <laughs> Nicely done. Well done. Yeah, I was, you know, when, when you hear those pauses, like I'm hanging off every word, right? And, and I'm like, okay, there's more coming. So, and, and I really like, you even brought your pauses, thanks Jennifer, into the statements themselves. Really nicely done, thank you. Thanks for coming up. So I, I wish we had time to hear everyone because you know, these two alone have been inspiring to me. What I'd say to you though is that make sure you deliver yours. <laughs> Find someone, could be a friend, could be a colleague, could be someone you've met here tonight, and take that opportunity to share it with them. Because even the process of actually speaking it will hone the thinking for you further. So, time for us to wrap up. I want to go back to the, the message I, I left, I want to leave you with. And it really goes back to this idea that leadership and communication are linked. And that every time you communicate, you have an opportunity to lead and inspire others. We heard probably 10, 15 people tonight, some of whom chose work examples, some of whom chose personal examples, but every single person we've listened to has identified someone or some group who they believe they can and should inspire to act. The key to capitalizing on those opportunities is to be purposeful. It doesn't happen by accident. It, the, uh, intend to inspire. Think about these audiences. How do I, not do I, what I want to talk about, but what do I want to inspire them to do or believe? And then don't wing it. When you get there, before you get there, get clear in your thinking. When you're clear in your thinking ahead of time, in the moment, it allows you to then speak with presence. Because you're not having to think while you talk. You can focus on that eye contact. You can focus on that pause. By doing these things, you can begin the process of building that muscle, that leadership communication muscle. So I hope that's been helpful tonight. If you're wondering how, okay, how do I start that work? Where can I get more resources? Well, first thing I'm gonna tell you, my call to action to you is that I want you to actually deliver what you created. Not deliver it like a presentation. Have the conversation. Meet with the person. Share the thinking with them. Use it and, and then self-assess. Hmm, how'd that go? Was I more present? Did I create that connection? What were the results? And it's not necessarily that you will necessarily achieve the action you want, but you'll be able to evaluate, was I successful? And not because people came up to you and said, oh, that was great. <coughs> Did they take the action? Did they fund me? Did they bring an idea forward? Did they you know, hire the people I wanted to hire? That's going to be your measure of success. And if you need more resources, delve into the sheets that I've, I've provided for you. You can also get more. Uh, I wrote a book, a couple of brave volunteers got one. You can buy a copy out there. Uh, my mother is now retired, just published another book, which we also have a few copies of, called Impromptu, Leaving a Moment, about how to prepare to be spontaneous, and how to use the same methodology for everyday interactions. And coming soon, if you want to get more deep dive into these topics, I'm launching a podcast. It's going to be called the Inspired Podcast, and it's going to be interviews with our own staff, but also with clients about really the, you know, the essence of how you communicate inspiration. You can also go to our website. We've got articles. Uh, you can download the script electronically on our site, and you can follow me on Twitter. So my final message to you is this is a skill. Start using it. Go forth and inspire. So thank you for your time. Mm.